Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, we would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for our alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences during this time when we are unable to easily connect in person. Before we begin tonight's program, I'm excited to announce the college is kicking off a celebration of the enduring legacies of our alumni over the next academic year. Our celebrating alumni contributions 200 plus years of impact, in, impact initiative will highlight the contributions our alumni have made to their professions, in their communities, and to the university. In addition to weekly social media alumni spotlights, we will host a special series of events like tonight's discussion for alumni community, in addition to marquee virtual events with alumni dignitaries. Please follow us on social media and watch your inbox for an official announcement about this special year of celebration. With that, I am pleased to introduce tonight's featured spe speaker, Professor Matt Bachman from the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry. Professor Bachman's research is supported by the National Institutes of Health and focuses on the maintenance of genomic integrity with an emphasis on DNA helicases and other factors involved in DNA replication, recombination, and repair. As you may have guessed from tonight's topic, he also studies the science of fermentation. Following his presentation, Professor Bachman will be joined by two local IU alumni, Ed Ryan and Brian Smith, as we take your questions. Ed is a chemistry alumnus and a co-founder and president and CEO of the parent company of Big Woods Restaurant Group, Flawfarm Brewing Company, and Hard Truth Hills Distilling Company. Brian is an IU alumnus and he is the master distiller and a co-owner of Hard Truth Hills Distilling Company, which is located just up the road in Nashville, Indiana. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion or moderated Q&A session. Simply click on the questions tab located at the bottom of your screen. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Matt Bachman. Hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Vanessa, for that kind introduction. Let me get my presentation up here. So like Vanessa mentioned, I am a scientist by training, uh, but I decided tonight I was going to exercise one of the five pillars of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I was going to act creatively. And instead of talking about the science necessarily of fermentation, I'm going to give you a history lesson. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about bread, a little bit about booze, and a little bit about biology, and it's all going to center around yeast. Um, so this is this is the organism that we're going to talk about, and let me switch my cursor over to a laser pointer so I feel like I'm in a lecture hall. Um, this is the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so this is the main model organism used by my lab and many labs around the world. And if you break down the Latin in the name, it basically tells you everything you need to know about this organism. So saccharo means sugar, myces means fungus, and cerviciae is the Latin root for cerveza, which means beer. So quite literally, this is a fungus that eats sugar and makes beer. Now, we use it in the lab for lots of other things, and bakers use the exact same thing to make bread. Uh, the distillers are using saccharomyces cerviciae to make uh, at least the uh, the pre-ingredients pre for hard liquor. Um, so this is really, it's a, a biotechnological and an industrial workhorse organism. Um, people, especially in, in the sciences, are interested in yeast because of the, the simplest eukaryotes. And so if you remember biology class, a eukaryote is a type of cell that has a nucleus. Uh, so humans are eukaryotes, yeast are eukaryotes. So if we study something simple, we can hopefully learn something about uh, more complex organisms such as ourselves. So yeast are, are fungi, They're, you can think of them basically as single-celled mushrooms. And it's not just Saccharomyces cerevisiae that's the only yeast, there are about 150,000 species uh, of yeast predicted. Uh, like I said, they're single-celled, so they're, they're microbial, um, but they're about 10 times larger than bacteria, which you can see in this micrograph here. So the rods are bacteria, bacillus, and these big uh, spherical shapes are the budding yeast. And again, this, this is really a workhorse organism. We're gonna to get toward this in the end uh, about how many, many biological breakthroughs were uh, discovered. 
Um, to dive right into fermentation, like I said, this is a, a sugar fungus that makes beer. So what they're doing is they're looking for sugar in the environment that's transported into the cell. Central metabolism happens, if you remember glycolysis, and that's how they're getting energy and their waste products are ethanol and carbon dioxide, which is what we're interested in uh, if you make beer or wine or liquor or what have you. Um, so really we're after what the cells don't want, the ethanol and carbon dioxide. And it's not all beer. Bread is a fermented product, cheese, wine, mead, cider, tea chip, chocolate, coffee. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, if you can think about things like pickles and kimchi, these are all fermented products. They're not all sing singly fermented by Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Many of these, especially sort of uh, in the vegetable realm are fermented by a host of different organisms. Um, but it's all the same fermentation process. So something akin to sugar goes in and ethanol, carbon dioxide, in the case of pickles, the different organic acids like lactic acid, acetic acid um, come out. So I think Vanessa has a poll uh, that she can run. Yeah, here we go, look at this. Uh, so if everybody wants to click on what their favorite fermented product is, we can, uh, we can see where everybody stands here at the end of the, uh, the, end of the show. Uh, Professor Bachman, this is Vanessa. Could you please turn on your video? Uh, yes, ma'am. There we go. Is that better? It's great. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just let this poll run to the end here for a, a few more seconds. Looks like beer's the winner. It's probably where I'd vote too. All right. Beer's the winner. There we go. Okay. So um, it's important to know that fermentation predates us. Um, this was the earliest form of energy production on earth. Um, microbes, whether they were yeast or some sort of protobacteria, um, they ate sugars or some kind of carbohydrates and they excreted ethanol or some kind of alcohol, it could be methanol um, and carbon dioxide. And they did this because these are waste products and they make their environment toxic. So if you want to kill the neighbors so that you can eat all of the local food, this is the way to do it. Yeast cells are naturally tolerant to ethanol. They're naturally tolerant to the acidification of the environment by carbon dioxide. So they can stand this type of stress, but maybe the neighbors can't and so that they can take over. And that's why uh, fermentation really took off as a, um, a metabolic process. And it turns out that alcohol and evolution are entwined. So fruit is probably the most abundant source of simple sugar out there in nature. And remember, sugar is energy. And so probably unsurprisingly, fruit readily ferments on trees and vines and when it drops onto the ground because there are microbes out there always looking uh, for the sugar. And animals are naturally attracted to the scent of fermentation because our brain tells us that means food is nearby. And so things like fruit flies buzz around rotting fruit because the fruit has started to ferment. There are actually lots of examples of higher mammals um, that get drunk routinely eating fermented fruit. So you can imagine a stampede of drunken elephants, you know, ruining a town or <laughs> a forest as they're smashing through the trees. And it happens all the time. Monkeys falling out of trees because they eat too much fermented fruit, sort of like a frat party. Um, so what about humans? We've talked about mammals, but where do, where do humans fit into this? So there, there's also a symbiosis between people and ethanol. So humans as a group make a ton of ethanol every year. So we're talking on the order of 40 billion gallons of beer, 7 billion gallons of wine, and 500 million gallons of distilled liquor. Now, in all of these cases, this volume isn't 100% ethanol, but if you sort of boil it down, that's over 2 billion gallons of pure ethanol that we're using yeast to make every year. And then another 8 billion gallons for fuel, uh, chemicals and pharmaceutical industry, industries, et cetera. And these are old numbers. These are from 2003. And my guess is that they're only going up and up. So this is an underestimate for uh, how much yeast is utilized by humanity. So how and why did this happen? That's sort of what we're going to get into. Um, basically, alcohol, alcoholic beverages are clean water. If you think, if you think about beer, if you've ever home brewed or you know somebody that makes beer, there's a boiling process that's involved. So you're killing all the microbes that are naturally abundant in that water, things that could give you dysentery. And so people realized early on that if they drank alcoholic beverages, 
they tended to be a little healthier than people that just drank water. Uh, eventually, the same thing became true of coffee, right? Because you, you boil the water for coffee. Um, fermentation actually adds nutritional content to whatever is fermented. So it's better for you, uh, in a sense, to, to eat and drink fermented products. And there are some health benefits of moderate alcohol consumption. It's, it's actually good for your kidneys uh, to be flushed out a bit with alcohol. Um, the hops in beer are known to be sort of anti-cancer uh, agents, things like that. So um, there are actually lots of benefits to, to moderate, you know, drink responsibly. Um, and it wasn't one or two places that sort of developed fermentation. Ancient mankind utilized it around the world. Um, and, you know, you, you can talk about it whatever terms you like, but you can say that it was invented many, many times. And, and why is that? You know, we have soy sauce uh, being invented somewhere 200 to 400 AD in China. Yogurt, which is, you know, your favorite fermented milk products, even earlier in Central Asia. Pickles in India. So why do this so often? And again, it's, it's not just that it makes it taste better and it's, it's more nutritional, but it's also a preservative. So alcohol kills things, acids kill things from fermentation. Um, and so the food's not gonna rot. This far predates refrigeration. So this was the best way to keep uh, cucumbers and other vegetables uh, edible throughout the year. It was by pickling them. Uh, and so, you know, as a scientist, I'm interested in the, the history of science. And what I found uh, through, you know, sort of reading on my own is that the history of fermentation mirrors the history of not just modern science, but sort of Western science as we think about it. And a lot of what I'm gonna tell you tonight comes from this book, uh, Proof by Adam Rogers. Uh, this It's a short read. This is a great book. If you're looking for you know, a Christmas or a birthday present for somebody, uh, I really recommend this. It's not super nerdy uh, that the average person can approach it. Uh, but if you're an alcohol aficionado, it's, it's definitely uh, worth a read. So I'm gonna steal a, a phrase from Stephen Hawking, give you a brief history of time. So about 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang happened. Uh, five billion years ago or so, the Earth formed and sort of squeezed out the moon. Three and a half to four billion years ago, so not long after the Earth formed, uh, life began. And that was the beginning of fermentation. So this was happening in the, the famous primordial soup. And then for a long time, nothing interesting happened. Yeah, there were some dinosaurs in there, if that's your thing, but they all died off. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 200,000 years ago, so on this time scale, that's really a drop in the bucket, that uh, humans evolved. And it took a long, long time for them to control fermentation. So it's easy to pick up fermented fruit from the ground. It's a lot harder to control it. And that happened about 10,000 years ago, as far as we can tell, somewhere in China. Um, distillation came along about 2,000 years ago. And then it was only in 1882 that we realized it was yeast responsible for this fermentation the whole time. And that sort of struck me as odd. You know, how, how can we control fermentation? How can we get to this part where we can distill things and we don't even know how fermentation works, the organism that's doing, doing the job? Um, and this goes all the way back to Aristotle now. So Aristotle is widely regarded, at least in you know, the Western world, as the first scientist. He studied physics, biology, geology, and he actually uh, produced the, the earliest surviving written work on fermentation. So you can, you can read his tr treatise on fermentation today. Um, this was 2,500 years ago, and Aristotle wondered why sugary liquid, so something like grape juice, became alcoholic. And his hypothesis was the existence of what he called the vis vita, or this vital force that animates all living things towards some goal. It wasn't that grape juice just turned into wine. Grape juice wanted to turn into wine due to this vis vita. And when wine got old and decayed and turned into vinegar, that was essentially the passing of this vis vita. This was akin to death. Um, and he also made observations that when sugary liquid, again, like grape juice, ferments, you get this haze formation. So this is non-fermenting sugar water. This is fermenting sugar water. And it's, it's a lot hazier than this sort of uh, clear liquid here. And if you wait long enough, eventually that haze settles out to the bottom. And they knew that if you took some of that sediment and put it in your next fermentation, it helped out. It, the fermentation took off faster. The product was better at the end. Uh, but that was basically the, the extent of what Aristotle knew. Uh, he knew fermentation happened. He knew haze formed. He knew sediment happened. 
but he didn't know what the sediment was. And so that's been the question for, for hundreds of years. And uh, eventually that sediment was called yeast, not because we knew what it was, but because we knew what it did. So in French and German, the, the words for yeast both come from root words meaning to lift, because if you think about baking, yeast is what makes the carbon dioxide, which leavens the bread, right? It makes the bread rise. The English word yeast actually comes from the Dutch word yeast, which comes from a Greek root for boiling. If you've, again, if you've ever seen fermenting wine or fermenting beer that's vigorously fermenting, you have carbon dioxide bubbling to the surface and, and bubbling off. It actually looks like the, the liquid is boiling. Um, and so that, that's where the word yeast comes from. And here's your little Jeopardy fact of the day, getting to the gist of something actually means boiling it down into simple terms. So that's, that's where uh, us stealing the, the phrase, getting the gist of something comes from as well. So we know the sediment's important. We've got a word for it or a different word, whatever language you prefer. So how do we figure out what the sediment actually is? And this is where the scientists come in. So biologists at this point had developed uh, the microscope. They were, they were looking at fermenting products. They, they saw little round things and they hypothesized perhaps they're the agents of fermentation. And Theodore Schwann uh, came up with cell theory. And in a nutshell, cell theory just states that all living things are made of cells. Right? If you look at uh, a bit of human tissue under the microscope or a bit of plant tissue or whatever <clears throat> organism you're interested in, there are small sub, sub parts and they call these cells. And so he hypothesized that the microbes that other biologists saw under the microscope were the actual agents of fermentation. Now, that's a biologist, the chemists disagreed. Um, the chemists thought that fermentation was simply a chemical process. You didn't need biology involved at all. And it just happened when fruit juice was left alone or sugar water or something with sugar in it. So they said, well, okay, sure, there's yeast in beer, but eventually the yeast dies and then it decomposes and that decomposition product process releases some sort of energy. That energy smashes into carbohydrates releasing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and then they spontaneously form into another uh, carbohydrate known as alcohol. And so this isn't actually that far from Aristotle's hypothesis of vis vita, right? This force driving things towards what they want to be. But this was state of the art in the 1800s in organic chemistry. Um, now I'm an academic, and so I can, I can poke fun at, at the fields, and it turns out that academics uh, now and then can be mean and childish. So these chemists actually satirized Schwann's work in, in one of their journals. And here, here's a quote from that journal. In short, these infusoria, or these, these yeast cells, eat sugar, eliminate alcohol from the intestinal tract, and carbon dioxide from the urinary organs. So I'm a biologist by training. I'm going to poke a little fun at the chemist here. I mean, who, who else but a chemist would think the liquid comes out of the back and the gas comes out of the front. But what they're getting at is the alcohol you drink is yeast pee. You know, they're poking fun at Schwann. How could this possibly be true? That's the stupidest thing they'd ever heard of. And this fight went back and forth, back and forth. They got Louis Pasteur involved. I mean, the, the science luminaries at the time all had their, their take at this. And it wasn't until a chemist and a biologist got together that they solved the problem. So the you know, the first great science collaboration. And this was between the Buchner brothers in 1897. They grew up yeast, they ground it up and fractionated the yeast into different extracts. And they found a fraction that when they added it to sugar would ferment it into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And they named that extra extract zymase. So that's the, the root word for enzymes, enzymology, biochemistry. This, this is where my, my current field of study was born and it was so important that they won the 1907 Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for basically creating their own field of enzymology. And this wasn't the only Nobel Prize given to yeast research. Um, many of the, the recent Nobel Prizes have gone to projects that uh, really started and laid the groundwork uh, using yeast as a model system. So uh, science that has bearing on chemotherapy resistance, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cystic fibrosis, cancer and aging, and sort of the basic processes that really underpin all of these uh, devastating human diseases. 
Uh, and that's, that's sort of where, where I come in at, at IU. So my lab also uses yeast as a tool and we use it to ask and answer biological questions in the lab. Um, so I'm gonna show you a slide that I use to try to recruit grad students. This is pretty busy. I'm just gonna, gonna touch on it, but we've got projects in the lab on a particular type of DNA repair that's important in cancer and uh, chemotherapy resistance. We're using yeast to learn about how different enzymes are regulated in the cell. Uh, we're using yeast to learn about telomeres and telomerase, uh, which has bearing on aging, premature aging diseases, and the natural aging of cells, uh, as well as cancer. Uh, and again, lots of processes that, that underpin all of these things. Really, the, you know, the basic biology of the cell um, we're, we're trying to learn about. And so we use lots of experimental techniques to do this, but yeast is our main model organism uh, to make uh, make our discoveries. And we've also put our yeast expertise to work uh, locally to help out the uh, businesses. So we've worked with uh, different breweries and distilleries uh, to help out with uh, some process innovation or maybe just provide yeast for them to do some experiments on their own. And this has been pretty successful. Uh, so Upland has uh, come out with lots of beers uh, fermented with, with our yeast strains, some of which we, we found locally here in Bloomington. Um, and it's been sort of so successful that we've, we've partnered up with lots of breweries and distilleries all over the country now. Um, and so I know uh, lots of you aren't, aren't local that, that have come into this Zoom. So maybe you see uh, some, some local flair here for you. We've got the Maui Brewing Company. We've got Rare Barrel on the, the West Coast in the Bay Area, uh, Dogfish Head down in Delaware. The list, the list goes on and on. Um, so that's enough about me. Uh, I want to invite uh, Ed and Brian to, to jump in here and we can, we can go through some, uh, some questions. So we'll wait till those guys uh, sign on. And I, again, I appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to, to join us tonight for this. Uh, if you don't know, Vanessa and uh, her office hosts really, really good uh, live uh, sessions of these as well. So when the, when the pandemic relaxes and they can start running these in person, I recommend uh, signing up if you can. All right, there, Ed and Brian. How's it going, hey guys? guys? How's it going? Hey Cheers. So, Cheers do we have any questions about the peanut gallery? Nice job, man. That was really interesting. Thank you. So we've got a few down in the chat box here. Ah, so somebody asked if Aristotle came up with a concept of the sour mash process. So Brian, Brian, you know what sour mashing is. Why, why don't you why don't you lay lay that on us so everybody knows what we're talking about? Sure. Yeah. So sour mash um, in the world of whiskey. Uh, Probably a lot of people are familiar with seeing that on a bottle of uh, Tennessee whiskey or, or some bourbon. Um, sour mashing is, is, speaks to a little bit of what you talked about earlier, Matt, where you uh, take some of the spent mash from um, an earlier fermentation that actually goes through the distillation process, um, and you add that back into the new cook. So you're adding that in with the fresh yeast and the fresh um, grains and water, um, and really, from, from what I understand about the history of that in the whiskey world, um, the, the fermentation vessels that they were using and the processes that they had in place uh, were, were not very sanitary. And they were also, uh, uh, they were also you know, doing large quantities, so they wanted to make sure that they didn't lose the fermentation. So the sour mash process helped to set the pH lower um, which, which helped to prevent bacterial contamination so the yeast could have a little leg up. Yeah. And so what we do at Hard Truth, uh, is so at Hard Truth, we're actually a sweet mash distillery. Um, just based on palate and flavor, um, all of the research that we did on the way into this, um, for the flavor profile we want for our whiskey uh, to create a more complex um, and flavorful whiskey, especially the younger whiskeys, um, uh, we incor incorporate a sweet mash technique where we start with fresh yeast, fresh grains, fresh water um, with every single cook. Yeah, so uh, 
in a sense, I guess Aristotle didn't come up with a concept, but he was the first one to document it. So people, people had been making wine and, and knew that if you threw some of the sediment in the next batch, it would, it would work better. And that's exactly the same thing with, uh, with sour mashing. Brewers are also starting to use this as a way to make uh, sour beer. Um, so that's one, one of the, the projects we helped Upland with uh, was the best way to carbonate their sour beer. And it turns out if you pre-adapt the yeast in, uh, in basically sour beer, so sour mashing it essentially, uh, it just takes off a lot better. So it seems to be sort of uh, fermentation wide that sour mashing is, uh, is useful. All right, we got another question here about how humans have changed yeast since we've started using it. And have we selected traits through selective breeding? Um, so 100% yes. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the species that's used to make beer and wine and you know the, the beginning products for whiskey and, and so many other things, but there are different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So cerevisiae is the species, you can think of strains as subspecies or ethnicities or something like that. Um, and if you, you take a wine yeast, you basically can't make beer out of it because it can't ferment beer sugars. It's been selected to ferment grape sugars or fruit sugars at least. Um, and so there's people have sequenced yeast genomes from everywhere, from, from soy sauce, from beer, from sake, from whatever you like. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of uh, diversity and you can actually sort of build the, the family tree of these yeasts and you can see different domestication events that have happened. There's a big one in Germany because there's a German brewing tradition. There's a big one in uh, England because there's a British brewing can, uh, tradition, a big one in Asia where all the sort of sake and soy strains came from. Um, so not only are we using yeast for our own purposes, but yeah, we've, we've certainly domesticated them uh, in the, the ways that we like. And I don't know if the you know, the, the guys at, at Hard Truth and, and Quafon use a variety of different strains for the, these purposes, if, if Ed or Brian wanna, wanna speak to that. Uh, sure, yeah, so I, I, I can speak to the, the distillery and um, those, those uh, yeast strains that you're talking about being isolated and, and um, chosen for different flavors. We work with a yeast company that, uh, that was able to give us uh, examples of distillate that have been um, uh, distilled by all the different, uh, lots of different yeast strains. And um, we were able to then do some trials on the front end of our, of our whiskey production. Um, and it's, it's really amazing that that one, you know, that one uh, uh, yeast, uh, that there can be such a different variety of flavors that you can get from the, di from the different isolated strains. So we've got one strain that gives me a, like a, it, it ferments very, um, very hard on the front end. And so I get a lot of really bright tropical, um, almost like mango notes um, in the final distillate. Um, and then there are other yeast strains that we have that are a little more mellow. They like to ferment at a little bit lower temperatures and you get a little more gentle, subtle flavors from those. Um, and and I, I just find it endlessly fascinating, um, you know, that each distillery has its own a uh, little uh, thumbprint as well of of the wild yeast that exist in the in the distillery and in the area around, um, and also the beneficial bacteria that that help to create unique flavor from distill you know distillery to distillery. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, as as far as beer goes, um, in a beer that's not heavily hopped, the the yeast can be fifty percent or more of the final flavor, and so your choice of yeast has a, a huge impact on, on the type of beer. You can start out with the same base beer, split it into five different fermenters and add five different yeasts and get completely different products at the end from the same sugar water. So, you know, anybody that, that enjoys a, like a proper German style Hefeweizen that's got sort of that banana aroma and flavor, a little bit of clove to it, that's all coming from the yeast. There's no, there's no fruit, there's no spice added. Those, those are yeast metabolic byproducts. So got a question about uh, does does our yeast go into scholars 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 in bakery bread? Um, no, not yet. But there's no reason it couldn't. Um, again, it's it's baker's yeast, it's brewer's yeast, it's all the same thing. Um, you know, if you make a sourdough starter at home, whatever yeast is resident on your sack of flour, that's that's what takes off. So 
yeah, Scholars Inn could use it. Um, we've talked a little bit with Oliver Winery, but for some reason, the, the wine the wine industry has shied away. I guess they've sort of just had their process locked in. I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see, what else have we got here? Oh, we've got some Q&A questions, not just in the webinar chat as well. So let's go to one of those. Can you speak to auto brewery syndrome? So, Auto brewery syndrome, for those of you that don't know, is a basic, basically a pathogenic infection with Saccharomyces cerevisiae or another yeast that ferments carbs in the alcohol. So you, you and I and everybody naturally have yeast on your skin and in your digestive system. Uh, but sometimes when the microbial balance goes off, the yeast take over. And auto brewery syndrome, is, it's just what it sounds like. You know, you, you eat carbohydrates and the yeast in your gut ferment them. And so you can get drunk without drinking a drop, um, drunk, drunk enough to, you know, fail a breathalyzer test. <laughs> um, and so there, you know, the ways to treat it are to try to kill, kill the yeast. It's really hard to treat yeast as opposed to bacteria because yeast cells are a lot like human cells. There aren't great antimycotics for those. Uh, people have used fecal transplants instead, you know, to, to repopulate their, their gut microbiome. Let's take another one here. So is the yeast I use in bread making the same that you use in beer? Uh, it's the same species. It's maybe not the same strain, but there's no reason you couldn't go to the Upland Brewing Company and get a little bit of their yeast sediment and make, make bread out of it. And there's no reason they couldn't make beer out of your bread yeast. Might not taste exactly like they wanted at the end, but it would still have alcohol and carbon dioxide. So you could get, uh, you know, natty light out of it at the very least. <laughs> Uh, okay, can I discuss wild yeast versus bacterial flavor profiles in beer? Um, so this sort of gets to what Brian was saying about, you know, there's a, there's a fingerprint of different local microflora no matter where you are. So if you go to Jamaica and you have a Jamaican rum, uh, the climate is hot, it's humid, there's organisms that thrive there that wouldn't thrive in Bloomington or Nashville, for instance. So we could never really recreate a Jamaican rum because we don't have those organisms, but we could, we could propagate those and, and pitch them into a, a batch of rum, I guess. Um, but wild yeast, uh, so we, my lab has, um, we found probably 400 wild yeast now, and we've brewed with all of them. We've tasted all of those beers, and the, the overarching flavor component is nothing. They make alcohol, they make carbon dioxide, yeah, carbon dioxide, and that's it. You wouldn't know there was a wild yeast in there. And so I'm convinced that lots of craft beer is contaminated with wild yeast because there's, there is no fingerprint. <laughs> there's maybe just a little more alcohol in it. Uh, bacteria, though, tend to be a little more pernicious. So there's lots of bacteria uh, that can get sulfurous, um, make sort of rotting compounds. Uh, there are bacteria that can make things literally slimy. It's called ropiness. You can, you know, pour a beer and get this runner of slime. Um, there are things that can make biofilms. You get this film on top of the beer. Um, and so the, the flavor, the flavor landscape maybe of bacteria is much wider than yeast. Although you can get some of the same things. There are bacteria that sour beer. We've been able to find yeast that sour beer. There's bacteria that can make things fruity. We found yeast that can make things fruity. Um, so there's, there's lots, lots going on there. Um, so let's go through some more of these questions and Ed and Brian, if you, if you see any of these and you, you want to dive in or shoot one toward me, please do. Looks like we have a question about, uh, open top versus closed top fermentation. Um, so I can speak to that. Uh, at our distillery, we have a, a classic bourbon style fermentation vessels, so they are completely open top. Um, whenever our brewery friends come over to visit, it absolutely uh, blows their mind, makes them extremely nervous. They don't seem to like it very well um, because, you know, in the, in the beer process versus distillery process, you know, in distilling, we ultimately are running it through a still and we're going to separate out and uh, keep the ethanol and leave the rest of the stuff behind. Whereas, you know, with beer, it all has to be very controlled and, and contained um, in order to reduce your risk of, of different cross-contamination. Uh, 
but one thing that they've done in the distilling industry is that they've been able to isolate strains of yeast that are so incredibly powerful and dominant um, that, you know, as long as they're applied correctly into the mash at the right time, the right temperature and the right volume, there's really, uh, it's almost impossible for them to be outcompeted. So um, while there, I'm sure is some wild yeast and bacteria that, that, uh, that exist in that mash while it's fermenting, uh, the, the primary yeast strain is absolutely, um, is, is absolutely taking most of the sugar um, from the solution and turning it into ethanol. Um, so, and that speaks back to what we were talking about with the, the different strains creating different flavors. Uh, but it's really also, you know, part of the experience. So when you come on a tour, you know, you're looking over this, this big vat of, uh, you know, of, of fermenting foaming mash and uh, people like to stick their finger in it and, you know, lose glasses in it and you know, all kinds of fun stuff. But it is, it's definitely, it's definitely part of the show as well as being functional. But it would, I mean, it would work with closed top as well. We would just, uh, a lot of closed top fermentation in distilleries um, have to have some sort of way to vent out the, the CO2, um, you know, and so that would take a, a, some, some additional um, piping. So with ours, it just goes out to the atmosphere and vents its way out. All right, so we, we got, a, I think, a fun question here about what, what beer shows up for us on a, on a special night. So what, what do you like to drink on a, on a night when you re really want a good beer? So Ed, why don't you, why don't you start off and we'll each take a turn. You're, you're unmuted now. Can you hear me, Ed? Yeah. Hey, Matt. I love that hey. question. So, what what so, what beer shows up for you on a on a special night? So, as we're moving into fall here, it's um, this is one of our favorite times of year because you have the traditional Oktoberfest beers coming out, and uh, I really like our Oktoberfest. We also have a Heffy Bison. Um, that we have on tap now, but my favorite beer is our pumpkin beer. Um, oh, all right. We call it put a fork in it, and it really is a fantastic pumpkin beer. I've challenged people for five years now to bring me a pumpkin beer that tastes better than our pumpkin beer. And, uh, no one's done it yet. It is a good one. I, I can I can vouch for that. What about you, Brian? What do you like to what, drink on a special night? Oh, you're muted. There we go. So I like uh, I like most beers, uh, but if I'm just today, I, I had some samples at lunch. I had a guest in, and uh, one of my favorites is is Java the Red, just because it's a it's a red ale um, infused with coffee, which is not real not real uh, typical. And I love the you know most most coffee or beers that are infused with coffee tend to be heavier bodied beers. Um, and I, I love that it's a, a nice clean red ale. Um, I also love Mexican beers just in general cervezas, uh, especially when it's hot out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I'm an equal opportunity drinker. I don't, I don't have a favorite style necessarily. Um, I do, I do like to drink local as maybe, you know, cliche as that might be. Um, but when I travel, you know, I, I look for the local breweries there. So I'm not always looking for an Upland or a Quaffon or, or, you know, a Taxman beer. I want to try what, what's local there. But um, I tend to go for really the palate wreckers. I'll do a double IPA or a big, you know, barrel aged Imperial Stout or a, a sour beer. So big fan of Upland Sours. Um, I like the, the QTFO when I'm in the mood for some hops. Quaffon makes a, makes a killer IPA. Um, and actually, you know, as, as far as dark beer goes, there's a brewery in, in Richmond, Virginia called Hardywood. And I've got a, one of my buddies from college lives down there and they, their barrel aging game is just on point. So depends on the kind of night it is, depends on the temperature. Um, but those, those are, those are sort of my go-tos on a, on a special evening. And thankfully my wife is uh, also a beer drinker, so we can, we can crack open a big bottle and split it. <laughs> All right, and we've we've got a a couple of questions at least that are I, I think along the same lines of um, how is yeast 
commercial yeast prepared. Um, so something like yeast for baking, uh, you, you know, you basically, you start out with a, with a starter culture um, and you grow it up, you propagate it, you know, tenfold steps in, until you've got thousands of liters. Um, and then essentially, you know, you're growing it in sugar water. Um, you need sugar, you need a nitrogen source um, so that the yeast can make proteins. Uh, you need a, maybe a buffering agent, things like that. But it's honestly, it's pretty simple. You can grow yeast in just sugar water if you're careful. Um, and you can centrifuge that out or let it settle out, um, decant the water, and then basically you just dry that yeast cake. Um, and there are various ways you can dry it. People run uh, hot sterile air over the top of it and sort of dry it that way. Some people I've, I've seen sort of extrude it like, like noodles uh, when it's you know, really um, uh, dehydrated. You can, you can sort of make it like Play-Doh and dry, dry it that way. Um, for things like baking, you don't, don't honestly need to be sterile. You know, when you make bread, it's not rising for that long, so there's yeast and bacteria there. Um, but for, for things like uh, sweet mashing and, and craft brewing, you want a good culture that's nothing but that yeast. There's no other yeast, there's no bacteria in there. So it's, it's actually quite a, quite a biological or maybe a microbiological feat to propagate large volumes of yeast. Um, in sanitary conditions and not contaminate it from step one to step 10, you know, in the factory and then get it to the, the brewery. And lots of these are, are live cultures. They're not dried down, they're shipped liquid. Um, so you have to have a sterile, sterile chain the whole, the whole way through. Um, and when you make a large batch of beer, you know, a 30 barrel batch, you're, you're inoculating it with trillions, trillions of yeast cells. Um, and even a, you know, a single bacterial cell or a single wild yeast cell probably won't do anything to that batch. But if a brewer reuses that yeast, um, it can affect downstream batches. So you, everybody needs to be as sterile as possible. But yeah, it's just as simple as uh, adding, adding existing yeast to sugar water and you get, you get yeast babies. Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. So we got, we got a couple people giving the, the stick of forking at the thumbs up. So that, that's a local favorite too. Good for quaff on. Do your, oh, okay, here, I guess this is one for quaff on. Do your beers contain lactose and do you label the container if it contains lactose? I can answer that question. No, they don't. And you probably know that better than I do, Matt, but that's kind of the way to cheat to make sours. And we actually don't make any sours and we don't add lactose to our beers. Um, Lawrence has a good question here, though. Um, he's asking what's in the barrels behind me. Ah. And I might add that everybody has good questions. Um, it's almost like we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? And <laughs> people are looking for something fun to talk about. But... Um, what is, and I believe we have someone on um, listening to this um, Zoom event in Japan. So I'd like to point out that our friend uh, Takuma Sato won the 104th running of the Indianapolis 500. And we made a, a beer called Sato 101 with Takuma when he won the 101st running. So um, we're pretty excited about the fact that he <clears throat> won the 104th running also and uh, now we're going to put the, the pressure on Brian to make a, a really cool bourbon that has some scotch undertones um, because we know that the Japanese love their scotches. Um, but anyway, back to what's in the barrels behind me, there's two things. Um, one is a, it's a 15 year old um, Tennessee whiskey that we'll be putting um, in barrels uh, with our name on them um, just because it's such a wonderful product. It'll be called Schoonovers and he was actually the first um, seller of Brown County so um, we're going to honor him with with that bourbon. The other thing is um, our barrel aged busted knuckle uh, which is a really cool beer. Um, we actually amp up the ABV of Busted Knuckle 
um, to about 10% and put that in the barrels. Um, I should also mention that our uh, we have an imperial pumpkin beer too on tap at some of our restaurants right now that's uh, that's also 10%. And I tasted some of that tonight. It's it's quaff worthy. My my wife and I go to uh, the the Big Woods Pizza restaurant for our, our anniversary. <laughs> that's our our big night out away from the kids. Um, so we, it sounds like we might need to get there a little sooner and try the, the Imperial Pumpkin. That sounds great. <laughs> get your quaff on. <laughs> get your quaff on. Uh, so there was another question about um, Belgian brewing. So that this gets to, to op open fermentation, uh, lambic beers. Um, so... The, the Belgian tradition is sort of the, the funkier beer. So it's, it's uh, sour, although not all Belgian beers are sour, um, but open fermentation is a big thing. And you know, the, the, the story that they tell everybody is that you know, the, the breeze from, from the local orchards comes in and it, it brings all these microbes from the fruit trees and the climate is just right and it inoculates this beer in, a, in an open fermenter. And that's how you get these these wonderful flavors. And you can only make a beer like that in Belgium. Um, and people believed that for the longest time. They didn't think you could make a sour beer in America. Um, but now everybody makes a sour beer. Um, and it turns out if you go to Belgium, and I, I haven't, uh, this, is, this is hearsay now, um, it's not really the breeze that's doing it. You know, if, you, if you've got a brewery and you leave the window open, it's the hot air from the, you know, the cooling mash that's going out. It's not the nice breeze coming in. There's an, an efflux <laughs> of, of brewery air. What it is is that they've got all the, you know, the wooden rafters. The, the brewery is inoculated with all these microbes. And so the steam rises, it condenses on the ceiling, grabs all these microbes and drips back down into the beer. That sounds kind of gnarly to say that, but that's really how the, the beer is inoculated. And when these older breweries renovate, they'll literally build a new roof over top of the old one instead of taking out the old one because they want that culture that's growing in those beams. Um, now that's not to say that you can't take a beer and put it outside and really have mother nature inoculate it. That, that's called a, a cool ship um, and, uh, as a technique and Upland does that. Many breweries have done that. I've, I've heard of people with mobile cool ships where they'll basically just put a big flat container in a, in a truck and they can drive it around to wherever they want and inoculate it in a national forest or inoculate it on campus. Um, and you can make fermentation work that way. It's a lot harder to get it to turn out well at the end. There's lots of beer that gets dumped because it tastes like tomatoes or, or something at the end of it. It gets very vegetal. Um, but the, the Belgians, uh, as a brewing tradition, really inspired so much of American craft beer just because they, they do have these techniques that you didn't find elsewhere uh, and the beers are phenomenal so if you ever get the chance to drink a proper Belgian sour jump on it a, a great lambic is, is not to be passed up okay oh I've got a question about about home brewing here um, so I, I do homebrew, not as much as I used to before my kids were born because um, my free time disappeared uh, every time I, I had a kid. Um, but I do, I do try to homebrew a little bit. I, I'll make kombucha, uh, I make beer, um, I muddled around with cider and mead, things like that. Um, and as far as tips for getting into homebrewing, uh, the hardest thing is just the first brew. It's just trying, you know, get, get in there, try to make some beer. You're going to make mistakes. Everybody does. If the first beer turns out great, doesn't mean the second beer will. Um, you're better off if you brew with a buddy. So maybe somebody that's done it before, or even if it's somebody new, just to check to make sure you're cleaning everything well. Um, that's the the real trick of fermentation though, is cleanliness is next to godliness. So if you're, you're cleaning all, everything, all the surfaces. So if you stir the mash with a spoon, make sure you clean that spoon. Stir, you know, clean your fermenters, clean your tubing. Um, if you give bacteria a chance, they will spoil your beer. So don't give the bacteria a chance. That that that's my best advice is to is to keep it clean. 
Hey, Matt, there's a question about uh, coffee. Someone's asking you to talk about coffee and fermentation, which I'm interested in because I don't know a whole lot about that. Yeah, so um, it's uh, coffee and chocolate and, and lots of things like this. It's, it's literally the bean that's fermented. Um, you know, some are fermented, I don't know how you call it, in husk, um, you know, whatever the, the fruit that, that surrounds the bean. Um, some, some are fermenting the beans themselves, whether it's a cocoa bean or a coffee bean. And these, these are obviously, well, maybe not obviously, these are solid state fermentations. You're not, you know, putting this in, in sugar water and letting it ferment. You basically just have a sort of a moist pile of biological matter, whether it's the beans or the fruit and the beans. Um, and that fermentation process ends up being really important because it can break down products that would otherwise, you know, be too bitter or too tannic or, or too off-putting in the final product. And it can generate um, flavor and aroma of products that you want in the final product. Um, so for, for something, you know, solid like a bean, I don't know how much nutritional content that may add. Um, but if you break down, you know, complex carbs into more simple things that your body can use, then there is some nutritional benefit there. For from what I understand, that's mostly the um, the sensory aspects is, is where fermentation really comes in. Saw a question too about making beer from stale bread. I don't know anything about that, but I will tell you just an interesting. Um, article I read about there was a bakery in New York that was taking leftover pastries and uh, bagels and bread and anything that was going to get thrown away and they were actually grinding it up and making whiskey with it which I thought was really fascinating so um, it just shows you that most a lot of whiskey um, innovation and uh, whiskey creation is always born out of uh, out of trying to to you know make something out of nothing and and use everything that you can to uh, to make some alcohol from. So I love that. Yeah, I mean, any place that you find carbohydrates, whether it's stale bread or or fruit, right? You you can you can ferment. And so um, there's a, a, a Russian beverage called kvass, K V A S S, and it starts with with rye bread. Right, that, that's it's basically a weak a weak sort of vodka if you want to think about it, uh, where the the fermentable sugars, the carbs, come from from rye bread. I don't know of anybody locally uh, that's that's using bread. Like you know, they haven't partnered up with a with a bakery to to use their cast offs or anything like that. But I'm a, I'm from Pittsburgh uh, originally, and there is a brewery. I think it's called. I think it's the East End Brewery um, that that has done this. They, they've taken, you know day old, two day old bread from, from a local bakery. Uh, they make a beer with it. I can't remember what it's called offhand. Um, and I'm sure they supplement it with malted barley. That's not the only uh, carb in it because I, you, need, you need a certain percentage of barley to even be considered a beer for tax purposes. <laughs> um, so to keep the, keep the government happy, I'm sure there, there's barley in there. But yeah, you can, you can certainly repurpose stale bread instead of feeding it to the ducks, you can feed it to your fermenter. All right. What have we missed? So we had a question about Matt about uh, does beer contain sulfites, which it does not. Um, sulfur dioxide is added to wine as a preservative, but it's not used in the brewing process. Yeah, and that, that's actually another difference between wine strains and beer strains. Uh, the wine strains are naturally more resistant to sulfur compounds than the beer strains because they've been selected for that. Um, when you make wine, there's no boiling step. Um, there's no kill step. And so sulfur dioxide is used to kill um, microbes that they don't want, bacteria and wild yeasts, whereas Saccharomyces cerevisiae can, uh, can stand that. But beer is boiled and it contains hops and hops aren't only delicious and smell nice, uh, they're also a natural preservative. And so you don't need to use uh, sulfur dioxide for that purpose. So Mark, Mark uh, added a question calling me out about my using stale bread to make whiskey and how can you call it whiskey, which I love. Mark, you should work for the TTB. Uh, <laughs> there's a, 
governmental agencies that, that monitor what you can put on a label and call it whiskey. And Mark is absolutely correct. So in order for something to be called whiskey, there are certain rules about um, you know, what can be added. So I would say if, if it were just bread that were made from you know, uh, grain, yeast, and water, and and baked, and then ground up. Uh, I think that would still qualify as whiskey um, by the law. But yeah, if, if you're using like some some leftover uh, sugared pastries or something like that, you'd have to have a fight with the the TTB on whether you could call it whiskey or not. <laughs> All right, I think we are getting the uh, the land the plane. Um, motion here so that's probably the last question i don't vanessa i don't know if there's anything you want to say before we we wrap it up thanks uh ed and brian this this was great i appreciate it and everybody else for asking questions great thank you so much matt this was absolutely fantastic um additionally i would like to also thank uh ed brian and brian smith for their time and expertise as well we are grateful to you all um, finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support